Hello everyone, welcome to episode, hold on, 61, I think. I actually probably should have asked that before I started the episode. I think 60, we're 61, right? 62. 62. Sure. Okay, yes. we'll go with that. Episode 62 of the Inking Out Loud podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Off to a wonderful start today, as usual. I'm your host, oh, Rob yeah. Santos. And speaking of as usual, I'm joined as I always am by my co-host, Drew McCaffrey. How's it going, everybody? <laughs> now, before we really get going, I want to stop and take a moment to thank our newest patron at the Radiant Tier, Joe Lott. What's up, Joe? Thanks for the support. Welcome to the program, man. Now, for this episode, we're going to be wrapping up Robert Jordan's and Brandon Sanderson's Towers of Midnight, Book 13 of The Wheel of Time. We left off last week at Chapter 29, I believe it was. <laughs> yes. So, Drew, let's recap... What happened from that point on? Oh my gosh. Like, this was not even intentional that we cut off where we did. I literally just looked at the number of chapters going into it. And I was like, hey, Rob, let's read the first 29 because there are 57 chapters. You know? And uh, as it turns out, where we left off was literally right before everything just went insane. Yeah. So chapter 30, kicking it off is titled Men Dream Here. And this is when Perrin and the wolves venture up Dragon Mount and see Rand make his choice and come back to the light and the last hunt begins. Chapter 31 is called Into the Void and it's where Matt finally defeats the Golom. <laughs> Chapter 32 is called A Storm of Light where Rand shows up at Maradon and absolutely nukes an entire Trolloc army. I mean... <laughs> Every chapter. You're stealing all my style points right from the beginning. I love it. I love it. Oh my it. gosh. So much happens in this entire section. Uh, but to break it down character by character, Perrin. Perrin goes on trial with the White Cloaks. He is found guilty of murder, but his sentence is deferred until after the last battle. He fights and defeats Slayer, but does not kill Slayer. In the world of dreams, destroys the dream spike, saves both his army and the White Cloaks from uh, Grandall's trap. He forges a hammer with uh, the help of the One Power. He, he forges Mjolnir, basically. Uh, Hopper dies. I mean, yeah. like Perrin's Perrin's whole whole sequence here is crazy. Uh, with Matt, though, he. Like I mentioned, he finally defeats the Golom. He, he tricks the Golom into a skimming gateway and shoves it off the edge into the infinite black. Um, from there, uh, he meets up with Perrin. Perrin gives him a gateway. Matt, Tom, and Noel venture off to the Tower of Genji, where they rescue Moiraine. Uh, Matt gives up an eye to do it, half the light of the world to save the world. And on the way out, uh, Noal, i.e. Jane Farstrider, uh, is, he stays behind to give them the time to escape, and he dies. Um, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll be talking a lot about that oh, later. <laughs> uh, uh, with Rand, hmm. he, he is once, you know, once again, he's on his, like, train of making reparations, here is where he saves Iteralda and his forces from where he stranded them in Maradon. He prevents uh, the invasion of a massive Shadow Spawn army. Uh, he he goes back to Tyr. Uh, he he kind of helps smooth some things out. He moves to uh, deal with the Borderlanders, which goes much better this time than it did in the Gathering Storm. <laughs> Because he's fully integrated with Luce You can say that again. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. And then uh, he leaves off where um, Lanfear shows up in his uh, in his dreams. And, and they have a little scene in the epilogue. Uh, <laughs> uh, but meanwhile, uh, there are a couple other important uh, plot progressions here. Nynaeve takes the Three Oaths. Avienda makes her journey through Roydion, which we will definitely go in, oh into Oh my more god, I can't wait. A little later. And finally, we get some scenes at the Black Tower, where we have Andral and Pavara uh, figuring out what's going on there. Also, 
to kind of put the bookend on this, Egwene finally takes down Masana, and the blood knives are uh, dealt with in the White Tower. Egwene bonds Gawain to save him from his wounds, and we are left with uh, an impending meeting at the Field of Marilor. <laughs> so, only like a five-minute synopsis of what yeah, happened in and, this and that, that's, that follows very closely... Um, what I'm going to be starting off my style discussion here with, a disclaimer about how much I'm going to want to talk today. Um, like, I've opened up before on these episodes by saying, I have the longest note file ever from before with talking points. <laughs> and I think longest note file to date when I was talking at the time was about twenty three to 2,500 words that I'd prepared in preparation just for, you know, an hour to two hours of talking. But today, boys and girls... <laughs> I've brought to the table a file of notes. Scrivener's reading it for me here at 3,900 words with oh, things man. that I want to say about the second half of this book. My notes for this episode are longer than my notes for the... I, I, cal, I actually went and calculated. Longer than my notes for the endings of Lord of Chaos and The Shadow Rising combined. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, like... Oh my god, I have so much that I want to talk about today. And it, as you said, Drew, it really kicks off as soon as we jump back in. The first three chapters that we got were Men Dream Here, Into the Void, and A Storm of Light, with each of our three Taviran really bringing us explosive stuff. Um, yeah. I, I, I don't know why, but I really, really, really want to discuss chapter 35, though, the right thing. Because again, we have this viewpoint going right into style here, we have this viewpoint switching between Perrin and Galad, like we had earlier in the book, falling out from the trial instead of building up to the trial. Uh And more, Uh we have a a different sort of cliffhanger, similar to the one that we saw in uh, in part one, but uh, we left off with another character in, in similar circumstances. I'm talking about these cliffhangers where we leave a character running, whether literally or even figuratively, the first time that we got this was with Rodel Iteralde, as he worked endlessly to hold the shadow spawn at bay in Saldea. But now we have Perrin picking up the dream spike, realizing that he can only shift to the perimeter, and realizing he doesn't know how to escape Slayer. So he just starts running with no plan on how to stop, and that's how the chapter ends. How did you feel about that, dude? Yeah, so... I think it's funny how I talked about and how we're talking about the explosiveness of of this segment and and especially those first three chapters and then like the next few chapters there um, how there are these explosive things that was the word you used with our three Taviran yeah where Rand shows up at Maradon and you know casts the equivalent of a one power nuke on top of about half a million shadow spawn. And Matt finally takes down an invincible, you know, shadow spawn assassin. But Perrin's explosiveness is much more introspective. And this is where, you know, when we've talked in the last few episodes about how Brandon handles certain characters, this is where I think he was at his best with Perrin. Uh, he has he has a kind of two-sided thing going on with Perrin in, in this segment. One side of it is Perrin wrestling with his um, his role as a leader and his responsibility to the people who follow him. The other side is him uh, wrestling and learning how to be a fully realized wolf brother in the wolf dream specifically. One aspect of this is right up Brandon Sanderson's alley, and that is the wolf dream stuff. This is a full-on training montage, Rocky-esque. Like, you know, you, you expect nice. to see Perrin, like, run up the steps and and pump his fists. Like, it, it's, it's the kind of action anime-esque, you know, you think of some of these anime, like, Dragon Ball Z battles. That, that's especially what I, what I always pictured reading these scenes with Perrin shifting around. Yeah, okay, and learning I can how see to, that. Learning how to flash... It reminds me of the way later Dragon Ball Z battles are animated, where where the two fighters will just like appear and disappear in different places, and like have a brief engagement here and then disappear, and then a brief engagement there, and like yeah. popping around. That's exactly what Perrin's doing in the World of Dreams here, and this is right up Brandon's alley. This is the kind of action sequence that, that guy can knock out of the park. <laughs> it's it's the cinematic, it's the visual, it's the motion. 
he he always has a sense of like fluidity and motion in his action sequences and that's on full display in parents chapters here but on the flip side one thing that you know i'm i'm not sure brandon is as good at as a lot of other authors that i've read is the more introspective side of things he's good at taking a character's internal landscape and drawing it out to the external I haven't found him to be super good at keeping it internal and exploring it that way. Or or taking the external and bringing the external internal, if that makes sense. But these parent chapters, that's exactly what he's doing. And he does it really, really well. And I think it's because he understands the kind of person that Perrin is. And I think in a lot of ways, he is the kind of person that Perrin is. Okay. It, you know, like, there there are... I, I mean, I agree, definitely. I definitely agree. Um, so, like, yeah. Sanderson is most flexible when he's writing certain characters, and it shows, and Perrin is definitely a stellar example of that. Mm-hmm. Like, like, where we talked about in The Gathering Storm about how great a job he did with Dark Rain. And he oh, did a my phenomenal God. job. Oh, he did. But what what he was so good at with Dark Rand was taking that internal landscape of him and uh, like showing it externally, how it affected the characters around him. It was less so about him internally growing and changing until like one chapter or two chapters right at the end of the book. Most of that book, it was all about how is Rand's internal state affecting everything around him which is something you know without spoiling anything that's more like what we experience with dalinar in Oathbringer. yeah okay yeah it's it's seeing his internal landscape affecting the external situation and honestly beyond Oathbringer, in words of radiance and way of kings too you know but here with perrin there isn't a whole lot of the external landscape that's getting dramatically shifted or or is like a major player in what is going on inside of him it's very uh self-centered which is a refreshing change for me because Perrin is such an unselfish character uh throughout the series almost to a frustrating point where i'm like dude like stop caring about these other things you gotta figure your own crap out like let's say a little more almost (laughs) (laughs) so yeah, like, I know this is like kind of delving into character, but it's still very much like writing style. How, how dramatically different these main characters, because we have significant portions in this part of the book of Rand, Matt, Perrin, Egwin, Avienda. And Perrin's, I think, uh, the, he, he's got his own thing going on in this way. And the only other character that Brandon has done it almost as well in this purely internal landscape is Avienda. Okay. Yeah. And and to this day, to this day, I think at least a top three sequence Brandon has ever written and very possibly the most brilliant thing he's ever done is Avienda's trip through Roydion. Okay, now when and you this say this includes this includes the Cosmere, this includes Skyward, this includes the Reckoners. This is one of the most incredible bits of writing Brandon has ever produced. Okay, so you may have answered my question there, my coming question. Because I was going to say, what do you mean by one of the most impressive things Brandon's ever done? Because this scene has Robert Jordan's fingerprints all over it. This is very, very similar to another scene that we saw in The Shadow Rising. So, um, when you, when, I just wanted to clarify what you meant by what Brandon Sanderson had done. You just meant in, in sheer terms of his writing excellence for the sequence. Yeah. Because so, like, this uh, sounds like something that Robert Jordan yes, would have planned like, like, extensively. Obviously, Brandon was inspired by what we saw in um, oh? the Are you... Road to the Spear and, and the Dedicated in The Shadow Rising. It was Brandon Sanderson's idea to write the Avienda sequence. It was what? It was Brandon. his. We know that for a fact. It was Sanderson's idea yes, to write did. this Avienda sequence as a series of flash forwards. Yep. Oh my god, that just blew my mind. I almost, 
I almost gave us our first sensor right there. I almost did it. <laughs> I almost did it, but I'm yeah, restraining this, myself. This was a stroke of inspiration on Brandon's part. Oh my god, that come is up with this, much less to execute it as perfectly as he did. I'll tell you, when I read this book for the first time, I read it in like the day it came out, I read it in about like I don't know, 9 10 hours, like I I like I do with Wheel you of Time. Inhaled books. this book, yes. When I read that Avienda sequence, I had to put the book down. And it was one of at, at that point in my life, one of two things I had ever read that made me cry. Oh shit. It like that two chapter sequence <laughs> almost crushed. crushed me. Oh, it my was God. so painful to read. But it was so beautifully done. Like, I, it, it was to the point that, up until now, um, you know, I've reread this book a couple of times, although it was years ago now. Um, I, I, you know, I read it when it came out. I read it again before A Memory of Light, and then I read it again after A Memory of Light came out. Um, each of those rereads, I just plain skipped the two Avienda Roydian chapters, because I couldn't bring myself to read them again. Wow, really? It affected you that much? Were you that yeah, in, that invested in the Aiel as a, as a society, or was it Avienda yeah, as a character? It was painful, perhaps? man. Oh no, the Aiel as a society. Probably. I mean, Avienda as a character <laughs> too, but but it was the degradation of the Aiel and this slow, horrible realization of what is actually happening, what's unfolding in front of you, killed me. And it actually came back to bite me. Uh, uh, kind of a funny story. Uh, last year at Jordan Con. I got knocked out of the trivia contest oh. on a question from this sequence. I was like, of course. Remember I what the question was? Because I wonder if I can answer it right now. Um, it was the, uh, who was the clan chief of the Tardad, like a Ruark's grandson or whatever? Like Ruark's um, grandson? Yeah. Um, uh, sorry, it was also with an R too, I believe. It was Ron, with an R. Rondrick, maybe? What, what the, damn it. Rodan. Rodan, thank you. I knew there was a D yeah, in there as well. I, I had no idea. I couldn't remember it because all all I remembered of the one time I read the sequence was just like the mounting horror. Yeah, it wasn't like names. You know, at the time, even if I had pulled a card that was like, "Oh, what was the name of Avienda's daughter?" Who we get a point of view from? Padra. I wouldn't have been able to say that. Right? Yeah, Padra. I mean, yeah. I know him now, but but like at the time, like I had almost kind of wiped my memory of the details because it was so horrible reading it. But that I is just like a testament a to how freaking good Brandon was in this. God, you know, you just, you, I, I've said it again, and then I'll say it again. I, it blew my mind just now figuring out or realizing, being told, that this was a Brandon Sanderson creation entirely from the ground up. I, I, I just, I, that is so unbelievable. I mean, I've, obviously, I'm going to believe it because Brandon Sanderson is a genius in his craft, but... <laughs> It's just so it's just so staggering to find something like that out when you're trying to re- maintain your cool and record a, a, a somewhat detached, you know, perspective. Oh my god, <laughs> that's amazing. Um, I, I guess I'll, I'll I'll still continue with our style discussion here by bringing up something that we haven't brought up for a few episodes now. I don't think, but I'm gonna oh. bring it to the forefront again. Dramatic irony. And this time we're talking oh, yeah. about dramatic irony in the hands of Brandon Sanderson instead of Robert Jordan, as we've seen it, you know, applied before. As Perrin approaches the White Tower in Teleronriad, and then we cut mm-hmm. to the battle against the Forsaken, the Black Aja happening that's in there, and then everyone realizing, oh, we can't move. And then uh, one of the Aes Sedai, I believe it was Saren, says, uh, no, it was Yukiri. She said, well, the sky is purple she said to me it was violet the sky is violet and every reader in the world at that point is going Woo! <laughs> yes yeah, yeah and our poor characters have no idea just how epic of a struggle they're they're really really in so it's just so delectable i love it yeah yeah it's i i like that you focus on dramatic irony in some ways because i that's something that i for whatever reason never really like consciously engage with i just kind of like get that detached like readerly chuckle yeah at the irony and then <laughs> i just move on i i don't normally interrogate it from like a, an analytical perspective or anything and i love that you bring that up over and over again because 
you're spot on. This is something that both Robert Jordan and Brandon Sanderson do very well. And I think it's something that uh, Brandon learned from Robert Jordan. We know how much of a, you know, a, an inspiration The Wheel of Time was for Brandon Sanderson as a writer. And then getting to work on The Wheel of Time itself. He says, you know, oh, I didn't try to mimic Robert Jordan's style or, or anything. But in a lot of ways, he didn't have to try to mimic it because he had already internalized it. Reading The Wheel of Time over and over through his childhood, you know, like and, and his young adult life. So it... It feels second nature as a reader. It feels like it was second nature for Brandon to write in scenes like this, using dramatic irony in the same ways that Robert Jordan did. Because that's just naturally how, you know, Brandon learned to write. Yeah. I hadn't considered that this is something that Brandon Sanderson was unconsciously doing. I figured perhaps that this is something that, uh, much like we were talking about in the last episode, I think it was, with, uh, it was definitely in the last book we were talking about how Sanderson managed to nail the execution of point of view in a lot of the same ways that Robert Jordan did when he was writing the series. And now we have an example of Brandon Sanderson. You, you were thinking, so you're thinking it's just like it's unconscious. I was thinking that maybe it's just like, a, like I don't know, it's, it's Brandon paying his respects in a way by giving us that chilling moment, that fun audience jumping moment that our main characters just have no idea we're experiencing it's it, it's so quaint it's so cheeky regardless of the of the intention it was executed flawlessly it was so yeah, well it, done it really was i will say though that i think there's a little bit of a difference between this you know these uses of dramatic irony and how he uses point of view he definitely takes um sort of foundational mm methods on point of view from from Robert Jordan but again as we discussed last episode while he has these staccato point of view shifts he does it in a more focused manner than Robert Jordan did when Robert Jordan used it it was like a shotgun spray of like eight or nine different characters to give us all sides of a scene whereas where Brandon does it oh, it's yeah. to give us two sides of the same coin <clears throat> it's parent and succession yeah 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 Interesting. uh the the only time uh i would say it really veers into the robert jordan-esque territory is during the climactic battle in uh tarvalon here where we're getting um Egwin and perrin uh like we're seeing two angles of a larger situation rather than two sides of one event yeah and, and each you know? uh, each respective party has no idea that the other struggle is actually happening yeah yeah like he, that is more reminiscent to me of how robert jordan structured say rand's battles against the shanchan in altara in the path of daggers right okay and swapping it with it with where, the, just the shanchan yeah. general you know where, where like what rand is doing Furet karid has no idea and Rand doesn't even know who Furet Kareed is, and you know, and and we're popping around showing different angles on a larger conflict. Whereas the Perrin and Galad sequence is like one event that both point of view characters are intimately tied into opposite sides of. And Brandon is using point of view to keep us attached to our protagonists, because both Galad and Perrin are protagonists. He doesn't want to have either of them come off as, you know, like, um, he doesn't want to set it up so that you automatically dislike one of the characters. He wants to leave it up to your opinion as a reader, which side you want to fall on. And and so by, by giving us these quick cut points of view on either side of the trial, you can make your decision as a reader with full information rather than just Perrin's point of view, or just Galad's point of view. Well said. Now, now in, in, <laughs> in impossible counterpoint to how much I was just glowing about a particular style point of Sanderson's, I'm going to ask something else. Uh, oh, related, okay. but I want to I feel you out on this one. Um, how did we feel about the entire, uh-oh, Perrin's going to finally attack Galad, and then, oh no, Perrin, please don't do it. And then Perrin going, well, I don't know, I'm really digging this mysterious vibe. 
You know, it's far it's far more dramatic to simply ignore your questions and let you just keep assuming the wrong thing. Like I, I don't know, maybe my opinion already comes across with that description, but how about you? I have two questions. Were you at the time already counting Galad as a dead man? And if so, did you feel afterward like your expectations had just been toyed with, and not particularly in a fun way this time? Uh, no, I never thought Galad was like gonna die. Uh, I will say that I did feel the author's hand a little heavy there. I suppose I should say the uh, children. Where... I didn't think Gal like Galad was gonna die either, but the children I thought were just toast at that point. See, I I didn't because I always. I always sort of counted on the Children of the Light being at the last battle. Like, I, okay. I just... Yeah, yeah. You're invested in that little bit, of, at least in them. Sure. Yeah. Um, but, but yes, like you said, there is a little bit of, like, toying with the reader going on there, and I did feel the author's hand a little heavier on the page than normal. We've, we've spoken very glowingly about how Robert Jordan uses the third-person limited point of view and Brandon uses the third-person limited point of view to hide and reveal information when necessary. This felt like an unnecessary yes, hiding of so information. Yes, so much. It, it didn't feel, I didn't feel like I gained anything out of that revelation at the end. Like It was just like, oh, yeah, so why was Perrin being needlessly melodramatic then by just maintaining his yeah. silence? It doesn't seem like something that Perrin would do right. it seems and, like something that was part of parents personality that was sacrificed for entertainment value that i just didn't agree with yeah it was it was there to serve to heighten tension mm -hmm. but you didn't need to do it to heighten tension if you had if we had understood parents mm -hmm. thought process there was plenty of tension there anyway you know yeah, oh, yeah. like how is it gonna play out you know, it's like yeah so when when there's already the 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 clearly working like design of the shadow in the scene the tension is inherent are they going to triumph over the shadow we already had this dark prophecy early in the book establishing the tension what's going to happen with Perrin is he going to fall is the is he going to be broken you know and and all of this stuff so you don't need to artificially uh, that was in the beginning in, of the book oh, I thought that was at the end of the book. Sorry, I did. I clearly didn't just read the book fresh for this episode, but I thought that was the shadow prophecy about Perrin falling. That was at the beginning of this book. Yeah. Oh, I thought it was at the end. Huh. Well, we, no, because we we get the uh, the scene. Oh, what is the name of the chapter? Because we talked about this last week. <laughs> I remember vaguely bringing up the the, the prophecy that Perrin was going to die. Yeah. Why? Why would I? Why would I brought that up if it hadn't been? I don't remember the name of the chapter, but it's early on in this book. Um, oh, like maybe within the first 150 pages with Moradin and Grandall. Oh, the Forsaken viewpoint that we had. Yeah. 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 Oh, she you gives Grandall the dream, or he gives Grandall the dream spike. Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Why did I think that was at the end of this one? Okay. Huh. <laughs> Well, there is a, a Moradin uh, Grandall scene at the end of this one, or a Shadar Haran. It was a Shadar Haran, and, 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 yeah, Grandall and Grandall there, at yeah. the very end, yeah, um, unfortunately. Which that's, we'll ooh. get to in the lore segment later ooh. on. But, uh, but yeah, like so there is already the inherent tension. We don't need some artificial, is Perrin going to suddenly betray humanity and betray all of his own values at the 11th hour in the penultimate book of the Wheel of Time and become a horrible person? We already had that question of is Perrin going to betray his values clear back in Crossroads of Twilight when he's trying to figure out how to save Fael and he has this moment where, you know, he's he's going down that dark path where he'll do anything. He will betray everything to get her back and then he comes back from the precipice and throws away the axe. So that felt to me... I, I I agree with you that there's a little element of like trying to toy with the reader. Yeah, and it, it's a very it felt long winded way to say that. No, yeah, and it, well, it's long winded because I we kind of got off on a tangent when I went. That was at the beginning. I thought it was at the end. So <laughs> that would have been half the half the length if I hadn't uh, interrupted you there. My bad. <laughs> but we are. I think at least I'm definitely done my style points for today. Do you have anything else you want to get out of the way before we dive into our characters? 
Uh, no, I talked about the main things I wanted to. Awesome. Awesome. So who are we starting with? Should, like, obviously the question that I ask every week. Should we start with Rand or save him? Uh, I don't have a lot know, about Rand this time. Let's start with Rand. Okay. Uh, and this is, once again, tying back to one of my style points last week. Um, and, and it's the continued aversion to Rand points of view. How everything is from somebody else's point of view. Uh, this ties back to what I was saying earlier in this episode about, like, you know, the internal versus external landscape of what Rand is doing and what Rand is going through. Here, it is very heavily external. It's it's how has Rand's apotheosis affected everybody around him? Yeah. We don't know. We really don't know what's actually going on in his head here. Uh, like, it's, it's hard to believe that we, there was a point in time when we didn't know what was going on in Rand's head because now yeah. we have context. We've read A Memory of Light. We, we have some we, glimpse. Yeah, we don't get a point of view from Rand until the epilogue. Yep. And then we're like, oh, oh and okay, I have to talk about that right? epilogue. Oh my God, later, for sure. Yeah, but but because of that, it's it's nice to see the the mending of wounds you know, bridges being unburnt uh, around Rand. And that culminates, to me, with the Borderlanders. Yes, I mean, that's my, and, my last point about Rand, too. Keep going. And Hurin. Yes! Hurin. Yes. It's, it's one of the more touching moments in the series where Rand says, you know, like, look, you got this guy. I need to, I need to talk to him. Yeah. Like, I need to... I need to apologize for how, you know, how awful I became. Because, I mean, it's it's hard to, to remember sometimes when you're this deep into the series just how uh, dedicated Hurin was. He was almost, like... He was, he was reverent. He, he worshipped yeah. Lord Rand in The Great Hunt. Yeah, and, and then having that trust and that admiration betrayed he was everything that Massima should have been yes if Massima wanted to do it correctly exactly but then despite doing it correctly all of that was betrayed by Rand mm-hmm. in the gathering storm and then here Rand says I recognize the mistake I made please forgive me you know it's and and you know it's just the culmination of the book long theme for Rand is forgiveness and reparation here. Uh, he does the same thing where, when he gets the information, um, cause he got the letter from Varen, mm. right? Uh, when he showed up at, in the white tower at the beginning of this book and, and he slipped the letter and, uh, and that letter told him, look, the white tower has met in Stepanias. They might have also, captured all solemn and rand knows if i'm going to make reparations with iteralda i i want to find king all solemn and rescue him return him reinstate him you know because he can tell that's what iteralda he already knows iteralda well enough well enough to know that he doesn't desire the throne he wants his siege returned Mm -hmm. Mm mm-hmm very, very well read on Rand's part there. And, uh, I mean, this this was technically my last Rand point, but, like, since we're on it already with Rand and the Borderlanders, I'll get this out of the way. What a scene. Like, I had to work so hard not to include this in my list of favorite scenes that we're going to get to later near the end of the episode. Like, I particularly <laughs> love how such a monumental chapter with negotiations at this scale culminates with Rand getting everything he needs but ends with him asking for Huron. It's 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 so wide for the entire the entire sequence, the entire scene, and then that last note is so personal. We see Rand's character at both ends of the spectrum, and it's just so quaint to end these mysterious viewpoints that we've had from Rand before we actually finally dive into his head, or at least I should say we dip our toes into the water during the epilogue here. Um, it, it was just it was awesome. It was awesome, and it was really, really touching. I guess that's what I'll use for it. It was touching. Um, but then we have 
seems like a storm of light. I don't Ugh. even know what to say about that chapter. If you're listening to me say these words, you already know what I mean. Like, if, if, if what we had here was one of the crowning moments in the entirety of the Wheel of Time series for sheer scale and spectacle, that was a scene that every single fan, I don't care who you are, old or young, man or woman, everyone had been waiting since the eye of the world for this scene. A glimpse yeah. of what Rand can do, released unshackled the dragon reborn not randolph or but the dragon reborn facing the shadow with all of the power that he could draw the majesty of the weaves that lose theron like his his side that is loose theron brings just oh my god i i i what i almost wish i could have been there to see brandon's face as he was tucking in to write this particular scene yeah, he must yeah. have been licking his lips somebody with the uh, with the talents of brandon sanderson getting to approach this scene oh my god it, Chef's kiss again, so good. So I have two things on on that specific topic on that mm. scene. Okay. One of them is that I I love how you specifically noted we've been waiting since Eye of the World. Yes, oh because the the last time we saw something of this scale uh -huh. and this spectacle uh -huh. was in Tarwin's Gap in the Eye of the World when Rand is using the power of the Eye and crushes another massive shadow spawn army. But that wasn't the point of that scene. That was only a couple of sentences in Eye of the World. The more important aspect of that, you know, that moment for Rand was his conflict with the Dark One and his internal conflict with channeling and, and setting the stage for what is happening to him. It wasn't about him defeating a Shadow Spawn army. That almost seems like an afterthought. Yeah. It's about it's auxiliary. what is happening inside Rand as he is using the one power consciously for the first time. <laughs> and then uh but here it's very conscious. It's very deliberate. It is the focus of the scene. And, and that brings me to my second point, and that ties back to what you said about Luce Theron's memories being integrated and all these new weaves coming in. I loved, it's, it's a tiny, tiny little bit, but one of my favorite parts of it, that, and it always stands out to me, is the ice shards. Oh, the drag car. Was, yeah, it was, it's so easy to forget about water as, a, as an offensive weave. And... You know, you, you think back to Doomai's Wells. What's happening there? Explosions, fire, dirt being, you know, like air ripping people yep. apart. And lightning bolts, air and fire, you know. But here we have like a water-based offensive weave, and I loved that. Mm. Yeah. yeah, no, it's it's definitely really, really cool to see. Like, I was, for myself, this, the, the part of, the, of that scene in, a, you know, a storm of light that really, really sticks out. You had mentioned it was... The uh, the ice shards for you it's a different reason though you were talking about the uh, the cleverness of using water as an offensive weave but what I thought you were going for there was just a moment where you were in awe of the man that Luce Theron must have been because for me that particular moment that one particular detail it wasn't a particular weave but it was the res the the remnants the result of a weave it was after Rand had re officially raised his hand completely in the air and then he closed his fist. And then it all stopped. It was super silent. And then we got the imagery of the Trollocs falling down to the ground, but at such a distance and on such a scale that when they're dropped by these insane winds, they just look like debris, just like leaves like falling yeah. in a storm. And I was just like, wow, that is such powerful imagery there. And it would have been so cool to see Luz there and at his prime just kicking ass in the War of the Shadow. Oh my oh, god! Oh yeah, you you gotta wonder like what it was like with Luz Theron on the front lines with Kalendor. What? Oh my god! Yeah. What what <laughs> were the hundred companions like before the taint on Saidine? Holy crap! Yeah, where they could successfully assault Shail Ghoul. Yep. Like oh man. <laughs> oh man, that's so cool. That feels like it could be a whole movie in and of itself with like a half billion dollar budget just for that one scene. It's so good. <laughs> But, just, um, just get the strike at Shale Ghoul. Uh, the strike at Shale Ghoul, yeah. It's, it's what is it, uh, two pages long? but Yeah, something. <laughs> yeah. Um, and my Super last short. point 
about about Rand is just something that we found out that he's going to have to deal with and something that he's going to have to come to grips with. Of course, it sounds like he's already come more than come to grips with it. He finds a little about a little more about the flaw in Colindor, and Min prophesizes yes. that it's going to be used against him. That mm-hmm. sucks. Uh, I mean, he handled it pretty well. He handled it really well. But damn, like that's kind of all he has to count on at this point. So, ouch. Yeah, yeah. So that wraps I mean, up the, everything I have to say about Rand. I do remember when, uh, you know, when I read The Gathering Storm for the first time, and it's such a majestic moment atop Dragon Mount, and you know, you're, you're so happy for Rand that he made this this choice. But at the same time, I was like, man, you just destroyed the Choidan call. Yeah. Like, yeah, I specifically so, remember so you're stuck with that. Kalimdor now, you know, and and Kalimdor is flawed. Like, what's going to happen here? So, yeah, awesome. Uh, uh, moving to Perrin. Sh- yeah, yeah. Let's move on to Perrin. I mean, I've already said a lot about Perrin. <laughs> I have a lot to say about Perrin. So if, if uh, okay. a lot of yours is out of the way, I can fill in some of the gaps for sure. Um, of course, I'm, I'm assuming that a lot of what I have to say is also agreeing with or expanding upon what you said. Um, <clears throat> Men Dream Here, Chapter 30. This oh. entire sequence. Last episode, I was rather indignant at True for leaving us off at the point he did, since we were on the cusp of greatness, uh, on the cusp of what I consider to be the best scene in this book. It was literally in the next few pages. It was the biggest case of blue balls I have... Oh my <laughs> god. But, like, like Perrin getting to witness Rand's transformation in the World of Dreams, like, or I should say from the World of Dreams, everything about the imagery here, we have the black clouds, we have the revelation that wolves have pseudo-prophecy in their own fashion about determining the last hunt or the likelihood of the last hunt happening. The, the light that shines through the blackness that covers Rand and the portal that he opens, the wolves howling in joy. I'm going to cry just thinking about it. Like, this scene... <laughs> This is a scene that, assuming the next 10 years or more go as planned, we're going to get to see on the screen. We better get to see on the screen. And I hope this scene ends like a mid-season episode somewhere in there. Like, what a rush. Oh, it, it also draws to mind, since we were, just, we were comparing Sanderson and Jordan's uh, moments of excellence just uh, you know a few minutes ago, I want to bring it to the fact that it draws to the mind a very similar scene in Lord of Chaos that I think Sanderson definitely did jordan proud hmm. i'm talking of course about oh my god the wolves have sh- have changed shadow killer in the howls rise in the distance and stuff like that it felt very similar and it was just perfect mm-hmm. you know that's a, a a funny point that you brought up about the tv show and how you were like you wanted it to be a mid-season thing or something uh, that just made me think i'm like how how would you want this scene to be portrayed in the show? Like, do you want it? For, like, cutting back and forth from Rand to Perrin? Or would you want two oh, separate no. scenes? The oh, way no, I would definitely want it book. entirely from Rand's point of view at first. And then in the second book, they would have to literally insert... They'd have to fill them, uh, film them um, simultaneously... And then just reveal the entire secondary shooting from, you know, a season later. So they'll have the same movements, the same facial expressions from Rand. They'll have all that down, but they won't reveal that they would have had an entire other crew filming from a different perspective as well. Like, I, 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 I think it would be done very, very well. Um, and there's some things in Mistborn that I think can accomplish a lot of the same, but I'm not going to go into details, obviously. So, but. so you would want, like, Rand's epiphany the end of a season and then this like early in the next season yes okay okay no, well, early it'd be, it'd be halfway through right because yeah that makes sense to me i, I like that yeah because i mean it would, it would it would really spoil a lot if you saw a parent training in Teleronriad with hopper at the level that he is i don't know like this would definitely be far more more uh effective handling it in the same way that the authors handled it. Well, Just... to be fair, they could pretty easily have this happen before the training stuff. You know. Yeah, where, like, he suppose. just yeah, happens yeah. to be dreaming with Hopper and Hopper's like, you know, young bull, you must come, you must see this, nah. you know, blah blah blah. But I love to see a storm. Like, 
And then maybe that seeing this happen and, and then, you know, the start of the last hunt, Perrin's like, okay, I need to get trained up here. And maybe that's the catalyst Enter for heart. Perrin in the show. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I can hear but, Survivor already. <laughs> But uh, oh, we're 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 getting way way off. There. <laughs> <laughs> but no, def- to answer your question, no, definitely in, in the same way the books portrayed it, and just make sure you film that one scene from the next season as you film that one in the previous season. Right. That way right, you have yeah. a continuity between like facial expressions and movement and blocking and stuff like that. Definitely could do that. Awesome, it'd be so cool. Oh yeah, especially to see yeah. that that storm in the world of dreams as like reality itself is kind of coming to a head and warping and storming around him. Like you could do so much with saturation, with color, with, with, with tearing. Oh my God. It, mm. Sorry. The filmmaker in me just yeah. wants to run with that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but so sticking on Perrin though. Yep. Um, uh, one thing I didn't touch on in either my synopsis or, uh, really in our style discussion when we talked a lot about Perrin is the culmination of the wolf side of him. Okay. Where he uh, he loses Hopper. Mm. He loses his literal spirit guide. But he has yeah. his moment of realization about Boundless and Noam all the way back from the Dragon Reborn. Yes. That his you know overriding fear about being a wolf brother was completely unfounded to begin with it was never something that could just by itself take over him it was a choice that he would have to make and sure it's a choice that if other pressures overcame him he might be tempted to take but Perrin being Perrin and Perrin having now gotten to the point where he accepts his responsibility of course he's not going to choose the wolf where, whereas if parents say, I'm going to put air quotes around this, failed in his pl- uh, like character arc of <clears throat> becoming a leader, if he let the pressures of, of leadership and, and the responsibilities of taking care of thousands upon thousands of people break him, which could have happened, or if he had let Fayil's capture break him, which could have happened. Yep. He might have been in a position mentally, emotionally, to say, I want the wolf. I want to consign myself to animalistic oblivion. I want yeah. to become the animal yeah. instead of finding a balance of man and animal. Yeah, it was it was Perrin, I would say it's Perrin coming to grips with his mistaken assumption about the mutual exclusivity uh, between wolves and men. In that he has to, he's either going to end up completely as one or completely as the other, and he's he's now finally coming to grips with the fact that it's just a daily choice. It's a constant struggle. You can, it's something that's ongoing, and it's both parts are him. I, I love yes. his 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 uh, his line with uh, Elias when he's talking about the banner, and he said, um, you know, to just quote off a of memory here, it it's always fit me. I just haven't always fit it. Right. That's exactly what he's come to. That's exactly where I liked uh, Sanderson taking his character at the end here. Yeah, like the struggle for Perrin so much of, for, you know, for what, nine, ten books of the series, eleven books of the series, um, <laughs> is uh, it's like this dichotomy that he has in his mind that man is man and animal is animal, wolf is wolf. And he doesn't understand that as a wolf brother, man is animal. Animal is man, right? Like, it, it's it's not an exclusive thing where you can be either one or the other. It's you are both. Yeah. Yeah. And it, it takes any given moment for him to choose which side he's going to heed, which one of his instincts he's going to follow. Uh, I, I, I love that Brandon Sanderson managed to nail that character so much and i know i'm sad we keep saying it but i'm just going to keep saying it because it's some of his <laughs> best work in this entire series nay in his life yet um i also want to talk about parents trial though i'm going to call it a trial well it was a legitimate trial i'm not going to use air quotes it was okay. i guess a legitimate yeah. trial um parent is found guilty and mm-hmm. i guess we kind of all saw it coming we kind of i mean it was not the result that we it's no it's hard to explain we didn't want the result, 
But we also didn't want a reason to think that Perrin is just getting off or that Morghese is just playing favorites or there's an unfair representation of what actually happened. Um, like, it just feels, it feels unreal. Even knowing what comes of that verdict in the future, it's surreal. Perrin is officially convicted of murder. Convicted, mm -hmm. not charged, convicted of murder. And we finally have a reason to fear Galad's opinion. Not because he's able to enforce his decision on Perrin in any way, but because we know Perrin well enough for now that if, if Galad, Galad? Yeah, uh, Galad calls for the noose, Perrin will answer if he has to go fetch it himself. Yep. Right? So, I don't know. What do you think about the trial? So I remember being very frustrated the first time I read it because okay. I was I, I wanted Perrin to get off. Sure. I wanted it to be like, oh, this is the truth of it. Oh, wouldn't, you'll wouldn't that have, you understand. You know, spoiled blah, your blah, opinion blah. of more gays a little bit, though. I didn't want my opinion of more gays to be spoiled. I like more gays. Uh, so what what has ultimately occurred, you know, in this read through, is that like, listen, they got it right. Perrin did murder two dudes. Yeah. Yeah. Like, he, he... It wasn't self-defense. They killed an animal that was attacking them. They were acting in self-defense, and Perrin killed them out of revenge. Like, it is murder. Yeah. Whether, uh, whether you consider it in the sense of, like, oh, like, this guy killed my dog, so I'm going to kill him, that's murder. Or this guy killed my friend, so I'm going to kill him, that's still murder. Yeah. It doesn't matter what what sort of uh, level of sapience you grant to Hopper, how much you humanize Hopper. Hopper it's was the still aggressor. Murder. Although I was, were the wolves originally the aggressors as a whole, or did the children perhaps start hunting the wolves first? I mean, it, it doesn't really matter. At In that this, point. I guess, with specifically with Perrin's level of guilt and yeah. the question of, like they're in. No, it doesn't matter. But yeah, um, yeah. Perrin killed two people. Mm -hmm. because they killed Hopper. Yep. That is revenge. That is murder. That, yeah, and, and it's both. Yep. Morghese got it right. Yep, she did. Um, Morghese got it right. Galad, I was pleased with the fact that he hadn't yet announced um, what the punishment was going to be, a sentence. And, I mean, at the point, at that time, he hadn't. He walked away, and then what we saw ended up being was very, very satisfying. Another reason to cheer for Galad dude is right. just so so i don't want to say righteous he's just so i don't want to say innocent either he's just so pure no righteous is the right word i think like it's righteous always has a flavor of i don't know no no but here's self-indulgence when when you say it, he's though. righteous not you but he's not self-righteous okay there you go okay you're right that's actually you know what semantically you're you're absolutely entire, like, entirely right i should have uh he's not self-righteous he is yeah. righteous subjectively, though. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also enjoying Brandon's take on Perrin's humorous side. Because we don't see a lot of it, but we never saw a lot of it before either. But we have yeah. this moment where Slayer appears at the top of the tower. And the birds... I think it was the top of the tower. I wasn't in the nightmare yet. And the birds fly. And he goes, yours? And Perrin responds with, well, I figured you'd see through walnut shells on the ground. Like, <laughs> I loved it so much. Or when Galad, he's saving Galad and the children. He tells Galad, "I'm going to stay nearby uh, and and just keep fighting." And Galad says, "A oh, simple heartfelt thank you, thank you." And and Perrin just like, "Well, I'm fond of the horse." <laughs> yeah, yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. I loved it. How about you, Perrin's humor? What'd you feel? Well, especially the lot. you know, I'm fond of the horse. Uh, that. I know that was a Brandon thing because Brandon wrote like all the parent in this book, but that smacked of Robert Jordan's humor that, and, and not even humor, but, but his sensibilities, it reminds me of a scene that might've happened in warrior of the Altai where like, you know, maybe Wolfgar shows up to like save a I dude and the guy's it. like, and the guy's like, oh, thanks. And Wolfgar's like, oh, yeah, I was just saving you because we needed the horse or something like yeah, that. Yeah. You know, it's it's this, like, bravado, <laughs> this, like, manly, you know. Yeah, we're good. At, we're, we have a pretense to, to act upon here so yeah. that we can maintain our masculinity. Definitely. Like, like the, the one line where <laughs> Wolfgar gets back and the and the sentry sees him and he's like, oh, you're alive. And and, and the, the line is like, you know, there were tears in my eyes. But then again, there was a lot of dust. Oh, how do you remember like, these? <laughs> 
<laughs> God damn, I had forgotten entirely about that until you brought that up. <laughs> that is so good. But, that is but, like something that Matt would have said in that moment that Wolfgar was thinking for sure. Well, when so that's why like Brandon can write funny things, and 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 he can write um, aware things, kind of self aware things. I just don't always find what he writes funny. Sure, you know? sure. Yeah, and I mean I have more to say about that. Brandon writing something objectively funny, but not subjectively funny. I'm going to say a lot about that with Matt. As we get to that character. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, but I, was, I still have, let's see, how much do I have here? I'm just going to switch my mic to another hand here. I have two more points of parent, three more points of parent here. One's just a, a note. Um, I was super pumped to see parents show up in school Egwene a little bit until the run Riaz. Or at least make, not school her a little bit, but make her question her a little more of her reality, such as oh, it is. Oh, he schooled her. Yeah, he schooled her. schooled her. I was just being polite <laughs> to Egwene for any Egwene fanboys out there. Uh, sorry, Craig. Uh, <laughs> he, he almost felt smug as he dealt with her problems for all of 30 seconds. You oh, know, he, see, I didn't even feel like it was smugness. It, it was just complete nonchalance. Like, this isn't even worthy I was sorry, he almost felt smug. I wanted to, I, I wanted to point <laughs> yeah. that out. I said he almost felt smug. I actually have that italicized. Almost felt smug, too. Because, like, erasing the Balefire is cool as hell. It, it, even Perrin has to know how cool that looks from someone else's point of view. And, on a side note, it wasn't until this read, earlier in today, in fact, that I realized, isn't this the first time he sees Egwene since the Stone of Tear? You know, like nine books ago? At the beginning of nine books ago? Ooh. Uh, she was already gone from Kyrian. Um, was, yeah. Yeah, I think it is. And isn't this also technically the last conversation he ever has with her? Because I, I know they were in the same oh. tent at Marilor, but you can't really count that as anything resembling a conversation between them two. Uh, I mean, it's tough to say. They may very well have had conversations at the beginning at of a Marilor. memory of light before, like, like the, I uh, mean, like Egwene is trying to you know rally everybody against Rand. I'm sure she would have spoken with Perrin. That's possible. Yeah, we don't know for sure, but that's also very. I didn't consider that, that the possibility of that yeah. and how long they actually spent. Um, organizing their ideas and their armies at Marilor before formally negotiating. Hmm. I also loved seeing Perrin embracing his Tavir nature for once. Like he like he sits the way he sits Galad down and he tells him, "Yeah, sorry, don't worry, man. The the weakness is gonna pass." And Galad, uh, yeah, yeah. He's, what, the weakness. He's like, "Yeah, bro, I'm Tavir, and you know, sorry about that, but what can you do?" <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, Perrin has never really railed against it before, like Matt has been. But it's still right. pretty refreshing to see him finally being blunt about, or being parent about it. Yeah, it was like where Matt very overtly revolts against his Tavira nature. Um, Perrin also does. He just doesn't understand that it's being Tavira and that he's revolting against. He doesn't understand that his Tavira manifestation is causing people to want to follow him. That he's a, a leadership magnet, kind of. He just revolts against the leadership in and of itself without realizing what the root cause of it is. So, uh, you know, but, but I, going back to your original point with like how he's overtly addressing his severe nature in this scene with Galad, I agree. I mean, it's, it's not something that Perrin has ever consciously addressed before. So, yeah. Uh, and it, it was kind of amusing too. Like you know, Galad feels like faint afterward. And he's <laughs> just like, oh, what the heck? What the heck is going on? I must be uh, real, more stressed <laughs> out than I thought I was. Jeez. Yeah, and it was also yeah. gratifying to see Perrin reunited with Matt once again. Because here's another character, unless I miss my guess, that we haven't seen in Perrin's presence since the Shadow Rising. And again, at the beginning of that one. Right? right, yeah, it's uh, it's when Perrin leaves the Stone of Tears yeah. the last time they, well, the last oh, time they the, interacted, yeah. they have been seeing each other, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they've been, yeah, yeah. I suppose neither of them wants to admit it at this point yet. Well, no, that's probably one of the they, things they talked about when they're uh, drinking their sorrows away and, and discussing uh, Warren's rescue. Yeah, the, the colors. Yeah, the, the colors. Fans of color and yeah. manifesting in visions of each other. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, the Wheel of Time internet. Yeah. Uh, the Taviran internet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, now, Matt. Sorry, are you done with everything about Perrin? Um, yes, I have one more thing, but it, I'll save it for the lore segment. Okay, okay. 
Um, <clears throat> so, so starting off here with Matt, Into the Void. What a satisfying read that this sequence was from the first word to the last. I, I'll admit I found the whole, like, okay, Matt dicing in the taverns and being recognized and nodding with macho mysteriousness. Just a little, just a tad too close to the threshold of fan service if that's what you yep. want to call it. But as soon as he hit the streets, I was invested. I remember, actually, pretty clearly, my first impression of the scene. Because I didn't think it was quite going to be over yet. With the Golam, I mean. I had assumed that the Golam was going to get away one more time. But, boy, was I pumped when that gateway for skimming came up. Such a neat resolution. I have to say, it's such a neat solution to the problem of the Golam. Yep. It, it makes me wonder if that's like a Jordan outline or a... Team Jordan slash Sanderson collaboration or what, but it was a stroke of genius. So I think it was a Brandon thing. Okay. Just because this chapter has Brandon's fingerprints all over it for good and for bad. Yeah. Like you said, there's a little bit of like fan servicey feel to the early scene with Matt Dicing. And there is a a convoluted nature to the whole plan and build up to the Golom's defeat that just feels very Brandon Sanderson. It's not the kind of thing that Robert Jordan wrote. Well, um, I'd just be like specifically about the solution itself, though. Perhaps Jordan could have included in his notes somewhere, the Golom has to fall through a gateway for skimming. But then Sander yeah, that, the Sanderson that could entirely very well that be. is executed. That could very well be. Um yeah, but but I just like uh, I remember reading it for the first time and thinking in the moment I'm like, yeah, this is awesome, but also like this is really convoluted, you know. And and it smacked of the like you know the backstories that Matt made up in uh, Gathering Storm, you know, the, this like weirdly overprepared f- Matt like that like Matt was always like when necessary um like a good planner but he wasn't a super convoluted planner the way brandon writes him uh like he okay. he figures out like generally speaking the simplest solution to a problem and he does it he doesn't sit down and, and like break out like a D and D board and like get this whole dungeon laid out you know that kind of a thing which is how this feels to me in this scene that's not saying i dislike it uh it is a super exciting scene it was it caught me by surprise that the golem was defeated as early as it was but almost immediately after feeling surprised i was like oh of course like there's no way the tower of genji is gonna wait till a memory of light a memory of light's gonna be the last battle yeah like, yes that's part partly where i was headed to when i was reading this for the first time um specifically with the Tower of Genji scene that you were just talking about. I remember like looking at it near the end and, and thinking and, like thinking like this is only a small sliver an eighth of an inch of pages left. Like you were cut that one pretty close. Were we there, Team Sanderson? <laughs> like, oh my god, I thought like I was almost expecting it to be in a memory of light somehow. And I was I was just it I was so relieved to see it there at the end. Because um for for anybody read you know who recalls our past episodes here with anything even resembling clarity, you will know that I'm such a huge fan of Moiraine. I've said it before. Moiraine is my bae. I've been waiting for her <laughs> rescue for years. Pardon, oh, my, no. my, my phone is going off for some reason here. Um, this scene, the Tower of Genji, this sequence, was the reason that I was literally trembling with excitement for days, before, years, really, before the Towers of Midnight release. I distinctly remember getting this far into the book and be like, oh my god, uh, we're not there yet. When is it going to happen? Um, but once we finally got it, you know, I realized using the word surreal to describe that scene is both appropriate and kind of ironic. But I couldn't believe what I was finally getting to read. We get to see the inside of that place in detail and we finally see that Moiraine is indeed there. I had somehow built up so much hype for myself around what was... What I was hoping to happen there, I was I was completely deer in headlights for the entire sequence. I knew Noel was going to sacrifice himself. I knew things were going to seem hopeless. I wasn't expecting the final puzzle, or that Matt still had one more secret about his Ashendari to work out. 
Yeah. Um, but it, it still sat more than satisfied the, the weight that I had been experiencing beforehand. It was awesome. Yeah, so when I first read it, uh, like you, I was expecting Noel. I was expecting Jane to die. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was not expecting the Ashandara twist. Um, but overall, and I saved this for this discussion rather than the style discussion uh, because I, I wanted to like dig into you know all the Matt aspects of it. But I thought for sure, reading this for the first time, I was like, this is one of the heaviest stamps of Brandon Sanderson's style on this series. I was like, it, it has that cinematic fluidity, the action, like the pace to it was so just like reminded me of Mistborn and, and some of the moments in Warbreaker I was like this is this is vintage Sanderson and this is why Harriet picked him to finish this series this is so good this is what we needed yeah. and then I found out a couple of years later Robert Jordan wrote this sequence and I was blown away I still don't I mean, know if I believe yeah. that though it's just so hard to believe that Sanderson or that Jordan managed to write something this, like obviously, I, I I fully understand and accept that Jordan can write an amazing spectacle himself, but something that is so just smacks of an author that is thirty years younger than he is. And mm-hmm. I just oh my god, it's it, I, you. Everybody can go back and listen to my reaction finding that out for the first time just recently within the last few weeks. I, I found that out on the air, and my reaction <laughs> was everything you probably are thinking it was unbelievable. Unbelievable. Yeah, yeah but it, it was this, like, I don't know, it was, it was a nice callback and touchstone for me as a reader to uh, recontextualize what I think of Robert Jordan as an author and what he's capable of doing years, you know, four, four years after he died. Three years? Four years? Uh, he died in September. When did of, this book come out? Uh, this book came out in November of 2010, two months after okay, so the Way of Kings. Three years, yeah, a little more than three years. Yeah, um, yeah. November 10th, oh gosh, I want to say I'm it was. Like losing, I was working at, at Quiznos at the time, and my friend Jonathan dropped it off mm-hmm. for me because he went with my money to go get me a copy. I remember that very much. Shout out to my friend Jonathan Vichel. He's one that got yeah, me that I, book. I, I vividly remember the uh, the apartment I lived in. That was my. Uh, That's around the time I met you, actually. Junior year of college, yeah. Yeah, that's what I read on the time, uh, yeah. time I met you was uh, just like shortly before Towers of Midnight came out. You were showing me Nightwish mm-hmm. songs and stuff like that. We're talking about Wheel of Time. <laughs> oh, hell yeah. So, so I want to I wanna ask, though, about this sequence, since you said Robert Jordan wrote this sequence. Did he write every word of this? Because there's a, there's a particular part that, I, that smacks so much of Brandon Sanderson to me, and that was the insult that Matt delivered at the very end. You unwashed lumps on a pig's backside. So I I do not know if he wrote every word of it. What I do know is that he wrote it. What I think happened was that he wrote it and then Harriet and Brandon polished it. Sure, yeah, that's I mean that's the likeliest if if he's the one that's credited yeah. for writing the scene, but there, you know, Sanderson is still in charge of inserting it into the story and making sure it fits as a seamless piece, at least as much as he can. Yeah, the right? only stuff I know that was just untouched for sure untouched written by Robert Jordan was the very ending of a memory of light. Yeah. Uh, but I, my guess is that the full scenes Robert Jordan wrote, Harriet and Brandon tried to have as light a touch on it as possible. So there may be sentences here and there, word choices here and there that are Brandon's, but Overall, it is. Yeah. I would. I would guess it's like ninety, ninety-five percent the words that Robert Jordan See, wrote. I was. I was already forgetting that this is in large part Robert Jordan's. Robert Jordan's work. This entire scene because writing my notes down, I wrote this. I said, "Sometimes, Drew, I hate you. I mean, you're one of my best friends. Sometimes I get to a line like this when I'm reading, and I hate you a little bit because now I don't like this line. It used to be one of my favorite <laughs> lines in all of epic fantasy." But now, now I can see that it just it kind of 
Nash's Iconomy clearly doesn't really fit. I used to glow about this line. It was for this specific line that I defended Sanderson a lot against those who were complaining about his portrayal of Matt, for example. <laughs> but after our brief discussion about Wheel of Time style cursing, it was also very recently, you're totally right about this one. I think you did bring this one up. I think you brought this particular one up. It just sticks out. It doesn't fit. It's objectively funny. It's a great line. It doesn't feel like Matt. It feels more like something, almost like something that would have come out of Scott Lynch in Gentleman Bastards. Mm -hmm. Like, you unwashed lumps on the pig's backside. I'll say, the image of Matt holding his hat as he jumped through the the portal was funnier than the actual one-liner was. Yeah. Yeah. The the other part, I don't think I, or just don't remember if I brought it up, but a lot of Sanderson's Wheel of Time style cursing, uh, and and like humor and like dirty stuff, you know, yep. not even in the Wheel of Time, but in other things, is very butt related. It's yeah, like, it's butt centric. It's, it's like it's like <laughs> the easy. It's the easy like humorous, dirty thing. Yeah, right. It's a safe one, but it's it's not like super raunchy. It's not super overboard, mm. but you know, like it's it's there for the taking as like a, a cursing or, or like a, you know, yeah. whatever exclamation. Um, and, and Robert Jordan didn't do that. He didn't have butt jokes. A lot of his cursing was like super nonsensical. Yeah. Like a sheep swallow and bloody buttered onions. Yeah. Yeah. And, and when it did make sense, it was like, when you dig into the meaning behind it, like, kind of messed up. Like, the one, mother's one milk always, a... mother's milk in a cup. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> like, when you, when you stop and think about that, you're just like, oh, what the hell, man? Like, <laughs> <laughs> why? Yeah. Um, continuing with Matt, though, and while we're, we're perhaps griping about Matt a little bit, I'm going to get this out of the way. Boots. I oh, yeah. didn't like Boots. I didn't hate it no. like I hated the letter, but it's definitely not Sanderson's best Matt. Like, I just wanted to stop and say, yeah, okay, we get it. Matt is simple. Not of mind. Very important. Not simple of mind, but of philosophy. That's why we love him. Let's not go so far, though, as to put it under a microscope and give it a title that sounds like an official diagnosis. I thought it was way right. too far. I was like, oh, come on. Yeah, I, I'm completely with you here. Uh, I know a lot of people like get a crack out of the boots scene. I Again, don't. objectively funny, funny objectively, but it just doesn't. It doesn't even remotely feel like a wheel, anything wheel of time, let alone matching coffin. I don't know. It didn't really. Fit. Yeah, yeah. I and, and especially in light of a certain scene in Words of Radiance. Um. In the Stormlight Archive, it's just like, okay, Brandon, like, you already made the joke once. You don't need to make the joke twice. Wait, what scene are you talking about? Words of Ra You can say it without spoiling? Boots. Boots. Oh, wait, Kaladin's, uh, okay, yeah. talking about yeah, Kaladin's like, boots. Okay. Yeah. No, no, talking, like, with Shallan and... Oh, with the, with her the stealing... The Horn Eater Princess. Yeah, like... Like, like, okay, dude, you already made one boots joke that didn't really fully land, and now you're gonna make oh, another boots joke that he like, that guy could just uh, like make this noise, and 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 three quarters of his fandom <laughs> would would tear up in laughter. Uh, he's he's probably re it's, it was probably received very well for the most part, just because old grumpy curmudgeons like you and I complain about it. I mean, I think a lot of people probably would have liked it, and I I imagine a lot of people liked this scene too, boots. I just not for me, not for me. Yeah, no, it, it it was like you said though. It was very much a uh, like super heavy handed, it, and it was just one of those instances where it was very clear that while I will freely admit Matt is much better in this book than he was in The Gathering Storm. Sure, uh, uh, Brandon Brandon clearly put his work in and and improved, but he still doesn't understand Matt. And this is him, um, like, just missing out on the subtleties of what makes Matrim Coffin Matrim Coffin, where he takes a 
an idea or a theme that is, in spirit, true to the character, but just going way overboard with it. Yeah. And that's why a lot of people will say in their criticisms of how he wrote Matt Cawthon, he's a caricature of himself. Attributes are exaggerated in the Brandon Sanderson books. Yeah, no, definitely agreed. Um, speaking of being a little heavy-handed with the character of Matt Cawthon, his apparent total surprise at learning Warren and Tom were infatuated with one another? Like, Really? Really? Does Matt strike everyone as a nine-year-old? I know he's immature, but he's not dense. He's not that dense. It's so dense, it's outright stupidity. Why did he think Tom had been so reverently keeping and rereading that letter addressed to her dearest Tom? Okay, this one I'm going to defend Brandon a little Whoa. bit on. Okay, go ahead. I'll because I think this is much less like a, a note on Matt's character as it is straight up fan service. This is Brandon saying, look, I know a lot of people totally missed Moiraine and Tom having Who missed you know, that? involvement. Is there are people that and, missed that? Oh, dude, to this day, there are people in the forums posting like, I like, did anybody see this coming? Like, I just finished Towers of Midnight and what the heck? Like, that came out of nowhere. Like, what are the biggest criticisms? I would just reply with Robert a slowpoke meme, like... No, one of the biggest criticisms about Robert Jordan, and I think it's in some part fair, is in his portrayal of romances, and that two of them in particular, people are like, Nynaeve and Leon just like are suddenly super into each other in the get in the Great Hunt, and then Moiraen and Tom, and I'm like, what happened what with the Eye of the World? Understand. The light in that scene when they thought everyone else had fallen asleep. Well, so like, but but it's like, but that's all part of the same situation. Where, where, and the answer really is, is that, look, that book is from Rand's point of view. We just don't see a lot of the stuff going on between Nynaeve and Land. Yeah. Um, but, but the Moiraen and Tom, like, yes, the signs are there. There are hints, but the hints are hidden. You have to read closely to pick them up. And if you're just picking up the Wheel of Time and you're like, oh man, this is a 14 book series. I'm overwhelmed going in. And so you're just trying to focus on the big picture things and what you perceive to be the important things. It's really easy to miss the hints about Moiraine saying, I know the face of the man that I will marry, and <sighs> things like that. I, it, and, yeah. I'm so, also, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> I, I, I really think this was just Brandon writing in a nod to the readers, knowing that a lot of people are going to be like, wait, what the heck? Where did this come from? I am definitely going to admit to being one of those readers who, as a teenager, was focused on the big picture, fo getting increasingly frustrated with the amount of tertiary characters that were appearing. I didn't care, and I just wanted to get back to Randall Thor. I wanted to get back to Matt and Perrin. I was missing a lot of the intricacies of, of and the brilliance of what was happening through the mid parts and the, the second third of the series. Uh, but this was something that I had not only not missed out on, this was something I had focused on maybe it's just because i was such a moiraine fanboy so i was like jealous of tom or something i don't know but mm. like like you, you to me you would have to miss so much for this to be a surprise like you've already mentioned a couple things but even going besides that you have to to miss well, uh, min's viewing about tom drawing moiraine's blue stone out of the fire her was it kisarai how they pronounce what is it called? Uh, the, the kisarai um but, I mean, I think, I always the thought... The chemistry the, between uh, the two and the Stone of Tear. I mean, the way she smiled so politely at him and how they were so, like... I don't know. Uh, e e the one, to me... <laughs> Tom was... saying, a properly set up, what would he say? A beautiful woman, even if she is Aes Sedai. I no, mean, there's no, so no. many you have to miss. Hey, hey. The one, to me, that stands out the most, <laughs> if you will let me say Sorry. It. <laughs> Sorry, I just... Uh, yeah. I want to show is her letter to Tom. It starts off with, oh, my dearest saying. Tom. You don't write, my dearest. That's the point I just wrote down here, though. That's, that's what yeah, I said. Like, Addressed to like, my dearest Tom. Yeah, like, there are many words I would like to write to you. Words from my heart. Like, come on. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, uh, yeah, but so but it's but it's also, like, easy. Again, as somebody, if you're, like, already overwhelmed with the detail... The thrust of that letter, all of that happens, those are the first two sentences of the letter. Yeah. And then from there you get into, you know, the reveal of, oh, Warren's alive. Oh, you have to come rescue me from the Tower of Genjay. Oh, uh -huh. you can only bring three people, blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, 
and and you have all of this like world shaking importance in the whole rest of the letter that it's easy for people to forget it starts off with my dearest tom there are many words i would say to you words from my heart because that's just the very beginning of it you know yeah it's true it's true i just i don't know for me it really felt like oh yeah fan service is kind of way that you put it i just i was just so frustrated with it at the time i was like come on how dense do they think matt is yeah. matt knew yeah Mad new. Oh, well. I'm done with Mad now. Should we move on to Egwene or Elaine? Uh, let's let's do. Because I only Elaine have one point first. Elaine. Okay. Yeah, right. I have I have basically nothing to say about Elaine in this. Uh, sure. I have one lore bit, but that's it. Sure. Um, I want to say I'm not entirely bothered by Elaine's politics this time. This time, seeing her reunited with her mother, working together to finagle two nations, that was pretty rewarding. Politics, they were interesting. Elaine is ever so subtle. That one line that she had that really sticks out to me. Would that Kyrian had similar stability? She's so deft. I just and not only is she deft, but she's she's not charging needlessly into danger anymore. You know? Like I don't know. I mm-hmm. she she felt a little more secure as a character, and I, I wasn't as bothered reading about her at this point. It was, it was interesting. I found her her actual chapters, despite the fact that this is normally the kind of thing that completely turns me off as a reader, I found them engaging. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Okay. Egwene? I've got only three points to make about Egwene. Yeah, I also have very little to say about her here. Mm. <laughs> um, I guess I'll start. I'll say that I was expecting to rail against Egwene at this, in this part. Um, and I will kind of complain about her a little bit, but first I want to mention and just acknowledge how damn clever she is. Like, we knew she was up to something at the beginning of <clears throat> the, uh, the, what the hell is I going to say? The chapter where the, uh, the, the, the actual attack at the White Tower happens. Um, and I, I still find myself so absorbed by her politicking in the scene immediately previously, which for me is a rarity. And I'm left like, wow, she's, she's really thought of everything. She's damn good at this as she's finagling the wise ones and uh, the Atha on Mier and their, and their wind finders and then I realized uh, oh, sorry and then I should say the forsaken attack and I'm like oh my god that's I totally forgot this is why we are here in the first place and I realized the magnitude of what Egwene had just done she laid the groundwork for some world changing social gateways between these distinct channeling societies but she's also laid an ambush for the forsaken that ultimately even if it didn't go quite as planned led to the defeat of Masana. Right. At the same time. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it is. And I will say, um, I know you, you've you expressed that you have a lot of complaints about her, like, post-Gathering Storm. Yes. Um, I, I never had um, as many complaints about her in Towers of Midnight. Uh I mean, I have some complaints about her, but this particular scene was one that helped mitigate her arrogance a bit. Where, like, yes, she is working to get, essentially, all channelers under the umbrella of the White Tower. Or all female channelers. But she does recognize that there are limits to it when people bring up, like, the points about Tarangreal and, you know, like, she... She understands there's a reality and that 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 reality means it will never happen. You're never going to get all the women completely under the thumb of the Amaral. Yep, she has to finally like, be pragmatic. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't really know how I feel about the, uh, the manner in which she actually defeated the Forsaken Misana. About her willing the the Adam away uh, until Iran Riyad, like it just sounds unlikely. Because uh, I, oh, I want to ask you, ooh. isn't this the exact method that defeated Mogedian? Uh, yes. To our knowledge, so, the most accomplished human being to ever walk the world of dreams, Mogedian herself can be brought to heal. But Egwene, she's just indignant enough to beat it. Uh, okay. Two things. One, Perrin's the most accomplished. Uh, <laughs> okay, so I was going to ask that. Then. But two. Think- for with a Magedian, she was too panicked to think straight. It wasn't that she wasn't smart enough or capable enough in the world of dreams. It was that Magedian was so emotionally invested in Nynaeve 
and so scared of what Nynaeve could do to her that when that collar went around her neck, she couldn't think straight. She couldn't think analytically enough. And this and this is in keeping with Mogedian's character as established. Her whole thing is planning ahead and being the coward and hiding in the shadows and only ambushing when she knows she has the upper hand. In the moment, she doesn't think well on her feet. Okay, that's fair. But, I mean, she was also imprisoned with the Adom for weeks, you know? Um, Not in Teleron, Riyadh. What did it... Um, I don't know. I, I, I she, she had the she had an Adam on her neck for like thirty seconds in Teleron, and then it was fork root, and yeah. she went to sleep, and then she had a real one on her neck, and she can't do anything about that. Yeah, like <sighs> Egwene, though. Actually, before we get onto that, I want to draw us back to something you previously said. So I was going to ask you then, comparing like for example, Perrin, Luke slash Slayer, and their 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 uh, talents in Teleron, Riyadh. Compared to, for example, like, say, the Wise Ones, who do you think, are you honestly, like, so you're just saying straight up with no contest, Perrin and, and Luke Slayer over, like, you know, Egwene or the Wise Ones and their uh, yes. talents. What makes you say that? Yes. Is there anything particular that that, that, that uh, you've seen Perrin or Luke do that There I'm not is something of? particular, and I'll get there in the last. Oh, hold on a second. <laughs> I think I might know what it is. <laughs> Yeah, we'll we'll get there in the lore segment. But that's a spoiler for the next book, isn't it? If it's what I think it is. Mm, no. Okay. No. All right. Um. Let's see here. Uh, well, well. So we're we're still talking about Egwene yeah. and Masana. Yeah. Uh, I didn't. I thought it was very in keeping with Egwene uh, and her character. She a had already had the experience with the Adam. Egwene is very stubborn, and she she is the kind of person to think on her feet and think analytically is there any way I can avoid the horror of what I've already gone through and so of course she'd realize like look this woman isn't as experienced as I am in the world of dreams and she also just had an object lesson from Perrin demonstrating that things that you think you can't mess with yeah you probably can one could probably argue that she might not be able to do that if Perrin hadn't just immediately shaken her faith about yeah, no, her. I I, I yeah. very much think that's the case. If she hadn't seen him just, like, unhappen Balefire and say, oh, it's just a weave, you know, like, she no wouldn't deal. have ever had the, um, like, the knowledge base to work from to figure out, oh, I can just unhappen the Adam around yeah, me. Yeah, it kind of gave Teleron Riyadh more context in her mind. Yeah. Necessary context. The one, the one side of things that I, like, I was a little, like, eh about in the Masana encounter was the reasoning behind how she broke Masana's mind that she's like, oh, I am the White Tower. Yeah. Like, yeah. Eh. The seat is ancient. I may be young, but the seat is ancient. And so... It's like, dude, you're fighting against one of the Forsaken. She's hundreds of years older than you are. Well, she's, no, she's, she predates no, the... Masana, I mean, how old was Masana when she went to sleep, for lack of a better term? Like, that, that's, that's a point that Cadswain makes. The Forsaken are still just human beings, and a lot of them are actually younger than some of the oldest Aes Sedai that are living today. No, the, the Forsaken were all, like... Because uh, uh, the war happened... Old. The boar happened like a long time before the War of the Power and the Sealing when they were 50 all years. sealed in. Yeah, and and they were all already established famous Aes Sedai at that point. Like they were they, were, they were hundreds of years old. Yeah. yeah. They were all like the most powerful of the chosen. They were the most accomplished of them. Like But still, I mean there are yeah, Aes Sedai who are centuries old as well. But and and on top of that, this is Egwene's perspective, remember. She's the girl who grew up with horror stories of the Forsaken yeah. being drilled into her. Like, like somebody... Yeah. I, I don't know. Like, I thought the whole reasoning behind that was, like... I'm not going to say what shaky, he... but it didn't taste well to me. Because... Or taste good? I, I don't know. Like Something was off. It, 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 a big part of it is that, like, I find the idea of the White Tower as an institution and the Amarlin Seat as, like, a symbol, this, like, unassailable, you know, height of, like, pure feminine power that Egwene makes it out to be is, like, super stupid because that leads to, like, all of this arrogance and, and 
you know, mm. bad thinking on the part of the Aes Sedai, where they just they buy into their own mystique and and become a huge hypocrites. Definitely, and, definitely. Yeah, um, and so using that as this symbol of Egwene's success against the shadow didn't sit well with me. Yeah. I don't know. Or maybe just it didn't it didn't hit the spot in the way that a lot of other scenes did. Like like to me, I feel like you could have made a good uh a good alternate scene with the same result where Egwene applies the things she has learned from the Aiel and from Warain and from the Aes Sedai and from her time in the sh- you know, as a slave among the Shanchan, like gathering the sum of her experiences and her stubbornness into one thing rather than just saying I am the Amerlin. Yeah. Like, eh. I don't know. I feel like thematically it would have been much more satisfying yeah. than upholding the, like, basically reinforcing what's wrong with Egwene yeah. as the reason she can defeat one of the Forsaken. So we've, we've been we've been moderately critical of, of Egwene's, uh, some of Egwene's plot points at, at this point, or at least her stances and her solutions to these problems, how we feel about them. I do want, at this point, to complain a little bit about Egwene as a character, or at least her logic, <laughs> or lack thereof. Okay. Near the end, particularly near the end, her she has a conversation with Gawain. And he informs her that Perrin may, in fact, take Rand's side at the Field of Merilor. And uh, he knows, Egwene says he knows something along the lines of, some part of him knows that his plan is wrong, that what he's doing is wrong. That's why he told me, so I could stop him. I'm paraphrasing, obviously, but it's the same point she was making. And I wanted to ask yeah, how goddamn infuriating that logic is. How do you think of that? Yeah, no, I agree with you there. It's it's just, once again, that, that arrogance coming through where she's like, there's no way she could ever fathom that she's wrong. I couldn't and be. So, despite all the evidence to the contrary... She has to perform these like mental gymnastics to convince herself, no, no, I'm right, he's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> like the... it's, and and like the the funniest thing is that when you go back to that scene with Rand, it's not him like saying, Oh yeah, come argue with me. He's just saying, in a month, I'll be here and we're doing this. Yeah. And I'm gonna tell you he's my not... demands. <laughs> like... Yeah, yeah. Like it, it wasn't like, oh yeah, no, here. Here, I'm going to give you this opportunity to come debate me in, like, some Socratic seminar. (laughs) No, he's just saying, yeah, by the way, this is going to happen. This is when it's going to happen. Be there. And she chooses to interpret that as, oh, he knows he's wrong deep down. And so he's giving me a chance to debate him and convince him he's wrong. I'm like, no. No, she's straight. (laughs) She's reaching so hard on that. Oh, my God. Anyway, that wraps up my character discussion points. I have nothing left but miscellaneous points to make. A lot of those, though, in favorite scenes. Um, okay, so before we get to miscellaneous points, I'll just do a quick lore segment. Yeah, go for it, man. And if you have questions after that, we can tie that in. Sweet. Uh, so, so a couple of these are about like the writing and the plotting of this story. Uh, first off, and that is the plot point around... Elaine gaining the throne of Kyrian, gathering support and, you know, making these alliances and, and giving Kyrian and Nobles titles and Andor and stuff like that. Um, this was a Brandon Sanderson decision. Uh, Robert Jordan had not decided before he died, whether this was something that was going to happen before or after the last battle. Oh, Brandon and Brandon, uh, chose to include it i'm glad he did so yeah i i'm glad he did too i think it works better with the layout of forces in uh the last battle in a memory of yep Light. yep um i think it ties in nicely to uh her interactions with Morgays and with perrin in this book yep um just like in a lot of thematic senses it fits so uh yeah um the <laughs> oh man okay and you know I'm, I'm just gonna go to avienda right now uh, okay go off, for it. if if people are wondering if we're gonna go crazy about nakomi information here if we're I... gonna have some lore about that um 
Go listen to our Crossroads of Twilight. That's exactly what I had written down about Nick Comey <laughs> in my miscellaneous. I said, if you want to know what we had to say about Nick Comey, go listen to, yeah. to Crossroads of Twilight. At the very end, we had a, a, an amazing lore segment segment with Anna. Anna? Anna. Oh my goodness, I can't remember how she pronounced Anna. it. Anna. Anna. My apologies, Anna. She she brought some great discussion to the table about Nick Comey. Go check it out. I will say it's not right at the end. It's like the last 45 or 50 minutes. Okay, the, the entire <laughs> segment about theory crafting is like an hour long, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but but definitely go check that out. Yeah. However, I do have one lore thing to bring up about Avienda and uh, her journey through the Tarangreal and her vision of the future. At least in the incarnation of the future that she saw, her quadruplets were the progeny of Moradin. Rand in Moradin's body. The, the genetic progeny of Moradin's body. Oh my god! So, if you go back and, and reread that, that scene with Padra, two of the four children have black hair. Yeah, I noticed that. How would two of the four children have black hair with a genetic line of all redheads? Well, Tam... And, oh, shit, no, that's Randall Tam Thor's body, in, though. See, Randall Thor's... Ta- Rand's parents were from the Andoran royal line who have red and blonde hair, and Janduin, who is Aiel, who has a line of red and blonde hair. And Avienda is fully... Yeah, but and on top of dark that, hair... If people... It's a dominant trait, though. If there's anybody in the line... Of course, the, he said that it keeps going back, yeah, though, then, as a lineage. Yeah, yeah, no. And on top of that, I will... Just to shut down any argument... Sure, sure. I asked Brandon Sanderson oh. about this at the Shadows of Self-Signing in Denver in... What was it? 2015. And he did indeed point out that that was well-spotted. Dude, so. I'm going to go here now, because Shadows of self tour would have been at the end of 2015 october november 2015 if i'm placing that in my i head believe correctly. it was early early october like october 5th or 6th yeah because bands of warning was released yeah. in january already after that um how have we now gone f- five years sorry four years and change four and a half years without you telling me this drew have i not told andrew you? mccaffrey I mean, you have not it. told me this and i am infuriated you well, I jerk. posted it in multiple forums. So. Damn. Oh, my God. You never told me you even got the, you, you asked Brandon Sanderson a question at that point. Or at least maybe you did mention it, but you didn't say what the question was. Well, I Pretty certainly sure have, have told them. you about... I've certainly told you some of the other words of Brandon yeah. I got from that oh, signing. Yeah. But those are things we'll discuss in some further Cosmere <laughs> episodes. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, oh, my God. That is insane to me. Because I just assumed that this was, you know, the night that Rand and Avi had just spent together before the last battle started. But you, you bring uh, up a good, so, damn good point about the, the so black hair. That was in the future timeline that got unhappened right. because of the dragon's piece. Yeah. Uh, it is at least implied that, yes, she did get pregnant at Marilor. Makes you say that. In what was the implication? Because they... Well, because they slept together. Like, that, that wasn't something that happened in Avienda's past timeline. Right. Or, okay. or like, in, in Avienda's, like, uh, Roydian timeline. Okay. They didn't sleep together. And that's why she, like, goes out of her way to ah. seek Rand out at Marilor. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. I have um, one last that I'm saving. Oh? Uh, this is the best of the lore points, in my opinion. <laughs> okay. You blew my mind with that last one, but go ahead, man. And we're going to start with your, your earlier point about uh, prowess in the world of dreams. Uh-huh. So the reason I say unequivocally, Perrin and Slayer. They have the ability to enter and leave the world of dreams at will, physically. Okay, is that not a spoiler for the last book, though? Because we don't see either of them doing that in this book. No. Because when it <laughs> happens... Well, well, first off, we've been seeing Slayer do this all series long. Uh, we've been seeing him do it since The Shadow Rising. And this happens because of Hopper's death. So what what gives them the ability to do this is the bonding of two souls in one. Uh-huh. Slayer this being the Wolf Brother abilities, not and the Luke. 
Okay, yeah. yeah. Slayer is Isam and Luke. Yes. Two souls in one. Uh -huh. That allows him to enter and exit the world of dreams in the flesh, in physical form. Okay. When you're in the world of dreams in physical form, you have a greater power and presence yes. than just somebody dreaming that. Yes, you can affect it to a much more efficient degree, yes. Yeah. Now, Perrin, and this ties back to the dark prophecy about, you know, the broken wolf and the death there, that is Hopper. See, I'd always thought that was Rodolie Teralda when he was apparently dead during the, uh, mm. the last battle. So that was Hopper. Okay. And what happened, that what actually happened, and this is confirmed from Team Jordan. When Perrin forged his hammer, Mahalanir. Yes. He essentially imbued the spirit of Hopper, Hopper's soul, in himself. And that's what gave him this ability. What the hell? And, if you look very, very closely, this might be my single favorite bit of Wheel of Time trivia ever. Uh oh The ebook cover and the trade paperback yeah, cover... Yeah, I want to talk about that cover. ...of Towers of Midnight by Raymond Swanland, who's, like, the best cover artist out there. Seriously, just, like, go look up some of his work, whether it's the Black Company or the Towers of Midnight cover, or, like, he's Dread Empire. Uh, amazing stuff. Anyway... The cover he depicts is Perrin forging the hammer. In the flames, rising off of the hammer, is Hopper. <laughs> oh, it's so chilling. I was thinking about that that ebook cover as I was writing my points about Perrin and about Maha Lion there. I was like, oh, 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 it's so cool. That has to be one of the best covers I've ever seen. Oh, it's it's my second favorite Wheel of Time cover. Among all of the the many versions, uh, the only one I like more is the Winter's Heart ebook cover with Rand and the Choid and Call and the the Black Dome of uh, the Taint behind him and Shadar Logoth. Um, I haven't seen that one. We have to check it out. Oh, it's so good. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that when I found that out, a it put together so many puzzle pieces for me with the series. And B, it just plain blew my mind that it was worked into the artwork of the book cover. Like, <laughs> oh, yeah. incredible. Absolutely incredible. So. Cool. That brings me, that brings me to the end of my, uh, cool. my, my lore All segment. Right. I am going to add another disclaimer here and say that I'm going to be, uh, I have so many miscellaneous points to bring up. Just moments that made me really happy. Thoughts that I had during this. Uh, series that I wanted to reflect upon here. I'm just going to start getting them out of the way because I'm realizing now that we are over an hour and 40 minutes into this episode, I think. And... Uh, yeah, just about. <laughs> <laughs> this may be the longest episode we've ever done unless I get my uh, my ass hauling here. So, an often overlooked moment in Chapter 33, A Good Soup. Gowan, after his conversation with Elaine and finally giving up his hatred of Randall Thor. I honestly have trouble remembering that he ever had this moment. Uh, and it continues to make me question my sheer and absolute hatred of the guy every time it comes around. But, oh my god, is he going to piss me off a lot in the next book. So I'm just going to enjoy it while it yeah. lasts. Yep. We're still on Gowan. No, sorry, I should say, since we're still on Gowan, his rescue of Egwene while she battles in the World of Dreams. Top-notch scene. Totally badass fight. I love how hardcore Gowan is. There's something to be said about his remarkable talent on its own. I mean, we always knew he was he was a proficient swordsman, but he's always overshadowed by others. Galad. <coughs> Galad. I don't tend to hear Gowan show up at the top of people's lists of most competent well, martial artists. because he's not. Well, so, it's like... He's he's a low tier blade master, but he's still a blade master. Yeah, like, like let's not forget, this is the guy that killed Hemar and Kulin. Yes, yeah. that's exactly <laughs> what I wrote down. My next sentence is, let's not forget, this is the guy that killed Hemar and Kulin. Like, let's not forget the shock in that one Suldam who immediately laughed at the ludicrous idea of any man killing a blood knife. Behold, Gawain Tricand, trapped in a room with three at once, and he slays them all before he's brought down. To protect the woman he loves. You have to admit one thing, and I will, I will, somebody who's a, very much not a fan of Gowan, I have to admit one thing, and that is that every single thing that this guy does is with 150% of his heart. 
it's not always in the right place, but you cannot deny that his heart is always there. Yeah, that's fair. His, his heart's not always like in the right place, but it's there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, I'm going to talk about one of the audiobook narrators, Kate Redding. She's a wonderful audiobook narrator. Don't get me wrong. She's amazing. But God damn it, she pisses me off with her pronunciation of the name Misana. Like, yeah, okay, clearly oh. it's an eccentric epic fantasy sort of name. The double A is probably going to be phonetically distinguishable. But there are times where she gets outright obnoxious with it. She started off normal, Misana, Misana, Misana. And then she ended up going into the territory of Misana. It's just, it's, it's such a stupid thing. I feel so dumb for complaining about it, but she almost feels like she adds two extra syllables. There it is. Now, to balance that, though, I'm going to compliment her a little bit with her delivery as Amis. How do you, by the way, how do you pronounce that? How do you, Drew McCaffrey, pronounce that name? Amis? 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 Amis. Amis. A-M-I-C-E is how you're phonetically pronouncing it. Amis. Like, uh, like with a schwa, like a. Uh, yeah. Amis, like U H dash. Okay. M E E S. I used Amis. to like Amis. I don't know why I used to like it that way, but Amis. Uh, her de- her delivery as Amis, all the wise ones, but specifically as Amis, is top notch. There is a specific line that I cannot listen to enough with Redding's delivery. It's the moment of dramatic irony that I was talking to uh, talking about earlier in our style discussion when the Aes Sedai and the wise ones realize, uh oh, we can't travel away from the tower, and Perrin shows up with the dream spike. At first, it's an, it's Saren who fails to teleport away and then the wise ones especially bear gear up to jump down her throat for it but then amis cuts in she goes bear i can't leave something is very wrong (laughs) this there are so many things that go into this line that make it raise the hairs on the back of my neck number one kate redding is amis her voice is so engraved into my head canon of this character that i don't picture Kate Redding in the audio booth when she reads Amis, like I do when she reads a lot of the men, for example. When she speaks, I see Amis. Never ever. Number two, never ever in my life had I heard Amis disconcerted. Never had I imagined her out like unnerved, outright unnerved. And then three, the the cherry on the icing on the cake, Amis interrupted Bear mid-sentence to make that point. Just just that line, there, I can't leave. Something's very wrong. It's just so heavily monosyllabic and delivered with Redding's kind of quavering rendition of Amis. I tell you, I was listening to this. I just happened to hear this as I was dozing off to the audiobook, and it literally frightened me awake. I'm not joking. My eyes opened wide, and I got a rush of adrenaline. It was so creepy and ominous, and I just want to say Redding nailed that line. She nailed it. Hmm. So I might have complained nice. about her a little bit with Misa and nah, and nah. but <laughs> she 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 nails these wise ones every time. Um, going forward, Silark and Mizar, rest in peace, my dudes. I actually I'm going to propose a toast to Silark <laughs> and Mizar, righteous to the end. Cheers. No, another point that stands in Gowan's favor, despite how much I don't want to make it, are the men that he befriends. He recruits, he, he plain inspires even. I um, I hammered this point across with our Wheel of Time episodes in the past, especially with strong women like Cad Swain and Moiraine, and how a true measure of their strength of character lies not only in how capable they are, but in large part due to how others regard them and that expectation they've cultivated in those around them. Gowan is a perfect example of this here. I don't know about you, but if I'm, fight, if I'm fighting against anyone, Shadowspawn, Aiel, or anything in between... I could do far worse than having men of the quality of Gowan's younglings on my side. Like, they are not yeah, yeah. only loyal literally to death, but they did so on the spur of the moment just because they saw the look on Gowan's face as he ran past them. Ta- especially Mizar, who clearly would have preferred to defend his friends, but had the presence of mind to obey orders and run for help. Like, rest in peace, you heroic, you heroic sons of bitches. Rest in the light. And on that subject, I suppose also rest in peace, Hopper. I wrote that down right after this because it made me think of it during my notes. Oh, One yeah. of the saddest moments in the Wheel of Time, which is remarkable. Like, we really grew attached to that grizzled old canine, didn't we? Uh, uh, I will say, like, I just do not understand 
the Hopper love. Like I, never, I didn't understand I it until Towers of Midnight. I was flabbergasted until Towers of Midnight. I I never felt an attachment to Hopper. In fact, like I never had. I like, would say I, I almost wonder if it's a thing where it's like if people who had dogs are the ones who like got attached. Oh, to of Hopper, course, that's got like, has to play into it in a huge part. Uh, yeah, like I mean, I didn't I didn't have pets growing up. Like I didn't. I just never. Oh my god! I would run into a burning house to save my husky. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But, uh, like people, people it's talk about bowl. like Hopper's dying in Eye of the World is like the saddest moment in the whole series. Oh, like, in the Eye of the World, yeah. what? This yeah. wolf that we had yeah. just met, who wasn't even distinguishable from from uh, what are the other ones? Uh, Bush Tail, Moon yeah. Dancer, Falling Leaf. I'm just naming Native Americans probably at this point. Burn. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, burn and dapple and yeah, uh, burn and dapple and and uh, moon dancer, whatever, however, whatever. Um, yeah, but but I, I will say, actually, I probably didn't even wasn't even aware that I was attached to Hopper until he died, and it brought that reaction out of me. Maybe just on behalf of Perrin, but I was horrified. And I was just saddened. I was crushed, and it might have just been a mark of Sanderson's excellent writing in in, in this scene. But I don't think I actually was aware in retrospect until. Hopper hmm. did die the second time. And then I was like, I think it's just because we know at that point, death is final in the world of dreams, right? It's so much more heavy for that. But, you know what, to counter this this toast that we just had in favor of, uh, or to say in honor of Silark and Mizar and Hopper, I'm not going to raise a toast to Jarrett B.R. Oh, in yeah. fact, yeah, no. <laughs> I'm going to raise a toast now to Dane Bornhold. The irony of which is oh, not lost yeah. on me, by the way, raising a drink to Dane <laughs> Bornhold. Because if there are three areas in this world that I would want to visit, I would if I could magically transport myself to Randlands. I said in the past, I'd want to visit the Anseline Gardens in their prime. I'd want to eat Ooh. at the Wine Spring Inn at a table served by Mar and Elvir. And I'd want to defecate on Jared Bira's grave. <laughs> Yikes! That is uh, that's some strong feelings. That is some very strong feelings. Um, I wrote down here. Yep. If you want to hear our thoughts on Nekomi, listen to the theory crafting segment in Crossroads of Twilight. The entire second half is good stuff. Well, come on now. The entire thing is good stuff. And before we head into our favorite scenes, to wrap up this. Uh, well, so what? Go ahead. I I have I have a couple of mis- miscellaneous thoughts myself. Uh, my own. Oh, go for it, dude. Um, uh, and and that I didn't realize I'll. Uh, Andral and the Black Tower. Okay. Um, I, going into Towers of Midnight the first time, I very much expected to get the Black Tower storyline wrapped up. Same. Very much same. Uh, I, uh, given the name of the book, for one thing. <laughs> yep. And, uh, and given my expectation, I already mentioned with, like, Matt and the Golom and the Tower of Genji, I was like, a memory of light is going to be the last battle, you know. Like it's that's what it's going to be. So we got to wrap up, you know, a few important things here. We got to wrap up parents' plot line with the white cloaks. We got to wrap up uh, Matt and the Terror of Genji. We got to wrap up Elaine and uh, and the dragons, and we got to wrap up the Black Tower. And then we only got a couple of scenes at the Black Tower, and only at the very end of the book. And I was like, huh. It just seemed like a very bold uh, move. Yeah. Narratively speaking, to to leave an unwrapped up major plotline for the final book when every other, when all the main characters' plotlines are converging on one point. Hmm. Because, you know, it, it would be so easy for, for us to leave this book saying, all right, we got to get Marilor, and then it's the last battle. Yeah. And then, oh, also, wait a second, we got to deal with the Black Tower, too. Yeah. <laughs> the Black Tower is going to have to deal with itself eventually. Yeah. 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 Um, I didn't realize you actually had uh, miscellaneous points to throw out there, too. I, just, I was just, like, rattling off all mine in succession. Uh, I mean, that that was my that was my main one that I, I just hadn't had anywhere to address Good point. in our main I remember that. I remember so. being shocked about that. And like thinking, okay, we're going to see the resolution of the conflict in the Black Tower at some point. Rand's already on a tear, you know, correcting all the wrongs that he's made. This would be epic to watch him just put Taim down in his place. But we didn't get that. 
that we never got yeah. that. I'm just so disappointed. Well, I'm, sure I'm not going to spoil too much going forward. Um, should I just jump into favorite scenes? Oh wait, hold on, one more, one more scene I have in my miscellaneous here. But, um, <laughs> I want to talk about this epilogue. Boom, boom, yeah. boom, boom. Set up, set up, set up, set up. Oliver finds the letter from Varen, and Camelin starts burning. Rand dreams of Lanfear, of all people. The Red-Veiled Aiel make their first appearance in the entire series. And the bookend, the irony of that particular term also is not lost on me here, uh, Lan, just as we had at the beginning, his journey to, you know, starting his journey to Tarman Gaiden, and finally ending his journey to Tarman Gaiden. What a novel. What an accomplishment with this novel following hot on the heels of The Way of Kings. It's only like two months later. Sanderson was at this point and likely forever going forward my favorite author of all time. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> all right. Favorite scenes? Okay. Do you want to kick it off or do you want me to? Uh, I, I'll, I mean, yeah, I'll kick it off. But um, I have okay. seven. I'm not going to talk about all of them individually. Don't worry. It took oh it gosh. took all of my effort not to include way more. I'll just rattle them off though without stopping to discuss because chances are at some point we already have. I'll take my honorable mentions here. We'll, we'll go you know our staggered normal three. But first, honorable mention into the void. Matt finally solving the pro the problem of that golem, specifically with the imagery of him uh, spinning the Ashendari with the end on fire and the wind making it glow. So he just has smoke in in a light ring around him as he's doing it. Ah, so good. That's like almost Kaladin Stormblast level imagery. I love it. Um, <laughs> honorable mention, A Storm of Light. Believe it or not, that's not one of my top three. Wow. Yeah. Uh, another honorable mention, the entire Sindel sequence from the Tower of Genjay. Believe it or not, none of that is in my top three. And my last honorable hmm. mention, Apples First. I, I love that chapter so much. The first chapter of this book is one of the best chapters in the entire real time. I love it. Okay. So, okay. So... I'll give you a chance to say your third place one, assuming you don't have a bunch of honorable mentions like I did, being selfish like I was. Uh, my my third place was Lan finally raising the Golden Crane. Oh! And rallying the Malkieri. I was not expecting to hear that one. Okay. Oh, that's my first curse word this episode. Damn it. Oh, no, well. you, you cursed earlier. Did I? Don't worry about it. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so my third... Oh, sorry. I'm here. I'm waiting for you to continue. So my third. Near Avendasora slash Court of the Sun. The fall of the Aiel in the flash forward. That's my third favorite. I call it, I call it a scene. It's two chapters, but... You know what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, so my my second... Uh, my second favorite is A Storm of Light. And I'm, I'm going to say, like, I want to make a distinction here that, like... It's not necessarily my second favorite. These aren't my favorite scenes, but these are the best scenes in the book, <laughs> okay. in my opinion. That's very similar to what I did, too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, so A Storm of Light, Rand, outside Maradon, just wrecking house. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. Um, my second favorite scene is For What Has Been Wrought. When mm. Rand returns after his apotheosis... And he sees Tamal Thor on the step, and he cries on his shoulder shamelessly in front of everyone. That was so powerful. That was so moving. That was so... Uh, so many words that that are not even coming to mind that I'm going to want to use later for this. But that scene was perfect. Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Um, and and my first, I, I already spoiled it earlier in the episode, uh, it is the Avienda sequence and ready on i think it's the best thing brandon wrote for the wheel of time i think it's one of the best things if not the best thing he's ever written Damn. Um, it's just a, a masterful masterful idea and execution so okay all right high praise from drew mccaffrey there because wow um my favorite scene is something that i've also already admitted to being my favorite scene men dream here and it's the reason i was mm -hmm. so indignant last episode on, on where we had stopped drew could you because i remember you saying at one point lamenting the fact that you hadn't actually stopped you hadn't actually stopped us five chapters earlier at, or yeah. four chapters <laughs> earlier at chapter 25 could you imagine how much more we'd have to talk about if we still had those last four chapters to discuss today as well yeah this would have been a ludicrously long i mean episode. it's already I mean, a ludicrously long is, but... <laughs> episode but it would have just been like 
Oh my god! And you know, it's 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 funny because if you had asked me my my three favorite scenes from this book, even like say two weeks ago, I probably would have listed at least two scenes from the Tower of Genji sequence. It, like those are what yeah, clearly stand out for me as memories of reading this book for the first time. But it's it, the ones I just listed now are the ones that moved me the most upon a much closer look. Um, absolutely mm -hmm. phenomenal book. I may formally list this one here as my favorite Wheel of Time novel. I know, Drew, you had said before that the, at first you had said The Shadow Rising was your favorite book, I including of all time. And then you later, during Knife of Dreams, you added a caveat. You said it might actually be Knife of Dreams. For me, yeah. Towers of Midnight. Wow. I remember wow. claiming at the time, uh, since we had him on the episode, Craig Hanks was with us for The Dragon Reborn. I remember claiming at the time that The Dragon Reborn held that spot for me. But I'd only yeah. so far really investigated and discussed three out of the 14 books. So now I'm definitely changing that. Towers of Midnight, without a doubt. Okay. Well, I think that uh, wraps up our discussion of the book. It but does. we still have to do the final draft. <laughs> we definitely have to do the final draft. Should I start? Rob, what do you got? Okay. So I have two entries this week for the final draft. One, um... I've, okay, so one that I've been actively drinking for the entire episode, and one that I've only tasted because I'm still on an alcohol cleanse at the moment. I'm trying to go at least 30 days being completely alcohol-free at this point, just give my liver a chance to rest. I do this periodically. Um, but the main drink I've brought to the table today, again, is the same fruit juice. It's a smoothie, really, from Bolt House oh, Farms yeah. that I brought in very recently. Uh, I think it might have even just been last week. If not, it was definitely the week before. But once again, tastiest yeah, thing yeah of all time, that I, any liquid I've ever graced my tongue with. So smooth, so fruity, it's the creamiest, sweetest, most fulfilling thing I've ever tasted. And it says on the bottom here, I'll tell you what's in it, this is the Berry Boost flavor. Uh, berry flavored blend of apple puree, ju apple juice, and blackberry puree in a blend of three. It is so good. It sounds pretty tasty. Oh, it's expensive though, it's like, I want to show you the, the, the bottle, it's like six bucks for this. Ooh. It's quite expensive. <laughs> uh, now, on the other hand, my stepdad, unaware that I was doing an alcohol cleanse right now, uh, brought something home for me yesterday, and I've only had a sip, and I gave him the rest, but I have the bottle here, and it does kind of really fit with it, the particular ending we got in Towers of Midnight, particularly from Rand's point of view, as he witnesses Landfear dragged into the darkness. This is a stout from... Uh, Boss Brewing Company, and it's simply called Black. Right there. Nice. And, of course, you know, as a stout, it's exactly what you expect in its color. It's very dark. It's very roasty. The head, believe it or not, the head was actually, like, the color of chocolate milk. It looked like chocolate milk bubbles on the head. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. But, it, you know, the taste's kind of bitter, almost like a dark wine. I swear there's some grape something fermented grape something happening in here so, some tannic character yeah i i can't really say it's my style still though shout out to my stepdad brian for thinking of me when he was out at the liquor store recently it was a damn good selection even if he didn't know it at the time <laughs> so that's it for my final draft okay so um before we get into mine, I want to say that I originally bought a beer specifically for this episode uh almost a year ago like I bought a beer for the previous Times Midnight episode. Um, and I ended up actually opening it up. And uh, I did so when I was a guest on The Dusty Wheel, one of the first uh, videos Matt did over there. Uh, we talked about the idea of prophecy and, you know, um, foreshadowing and things like that in The Wheel of Time. And uh, I we talked at length about the Avienda sequence in Rodion and as a little bit of, you know, a, a promo thing for our podcast, I brought this beer on that episode and it was called future knowledge. Oh, and uh, yeah. So uh, for obvious reasons, that was my original plan for this, but because I drank that on, on the dusty wheel instead, <laughs> I, uh, I'm sure you have another, one. I brought in a different beer. Okay. And I brought in a beer. Uh, it's a Kolsch, which is okay. a, a classic german style uh this is from anchorage brewing company in Alaska. oh yeah you feature brought, them all the time yeah they just i mean they keep churning out beers with great names so uh <laughs> there this is not the last time i'm gonna feature them i could guarantee that uh uh 
but yeah, it's a it's a Kolsch. It's a four point five percent, very light. Um, there's you know some good like kind of like lemongrass aroma on it. It's it's really just like bright and and drinkable. Nice grainy aftertaste. Very very refreshing. But uh, f- the reason I brought this in for Towers of Midnight is that this bad boy here is called Man Is Animal. <laughs> Come on! Are you kidding me? <laughs> I, uh, that was so subliminal what you did before. I can see it now. I can see it now. Oh, uh, I can hear it now. That's amazing. Well, well yeah. played, my man. Once, n- yeah, you do not disappoint. Yeah, we'll we'll see what I'm gonna end up doing for our memory of light episodes. I have my beer already selected for our final Wheel of Time episode oh. on on the last part of Memory of Light. But I don't know what I'm going to bring in yet for the first two for a Memory of Light. So we'll see what I can come up with. All right. Uh, might be a little tough, given the current uh, state of things, to, to get out and actually find a, you know some good beers. But, but I'll figure something I out. I can't believe we're heading into the last Wheel of Time book, man. I can't believe Dude, we're doing that. Oh, my God. We've been doing Wheel of Time for so long, but it feels like we haven't been doing it at all. Like, it's... I know. Ugh. It's it's in, insane. We started reading these books almost like what eight eight months ago. It was like September or something. Yeah, definitely seven months ago. <laughs> so, no, I think it was August. Yeah, it was eight months ago. What really? Yeah, I think it was August. Holy crap! <laughs> might have even been we we might have actually been reading them at the end of July. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> we, uh... That's amazing to me, and then we're, we're we're coming to an end here. So, how how many parts are we going to be doing for a memory of light? Yes. So, for a memory of light, our first episode uh, is going to be a monster. We're going to read the first thirty six chapters, and then our second episode is going to cover chapter thirty seven, the last battle. Mm-hmm. And our third episode is going to be the rest of a memory of light and a general wheel of time you know, wrap up discussion. So you will definitely want to check in for those. <laughs> oh, heck yes, you do. For sure. Yeah. We're, we're going to try, uh, we, we have some, uh, plans for guests. Uh, we're, we're not sure if everything's going to come off given the, the, uh, COVID situation with, uh, you know, quarantining and stuff. Um, if we can get, if we can get the proper infrastructure in place, we'll still try and, and get our guests on. But uh, otherwise, um, you know, we'll we'll at least have a couple of guests over those episodes. And uh, yeah, we, we hope you tune in for those. But that said, this has been, what did we say it was? Episode 62? 62? I still want to say it's 61, 61. Because, but we'll, we'll, I'll go preemptively right now at 62. We'll, we'll definitely mark it as the right episode when we finish editing it. Uh, it is 62. Yeah, ah! Gathering Storm Part 1 was 59. So. Damn. Okay. Um, yeah, so this has been episode 62. Man, we're, we're this deep in now that we're losing track. <laughs> Crazy. Uh, <laughs> uh, but like we said, next up is uh, the first 36 chapters of A Memory of Light. If you want to get early access to that, check us out on uh, patreon.com slash inking out loud. Uh, in addition to early access, you can get, you know, the monthly newsletter monthly short fiction uh we have bonus episodes uh we've been mostly doing one bonus episode a month but given the current situation we might be uh, bumping that up to two since we have more time than normal <laughs> uh yeah but check us out there all of those proceeds go to paying for the sound engineering art for the show uh, pat and danny so that that help is very much appreciated it helps us keep this thing going as always, I'm your host, Drew McCaffrey, and with me is my co-host, Rob Santos. Yeah, buddy. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time. Bye, everyone.